Good evening. <laughs> Theologians, you know. So uh, I'm Paul. Uh, Mr. Young's my dad, so don't make that mistake. And uh, he's, he's eight, almost 88. So maybe when he dies, I'll be Mr. Young. But for now, I'm just Paul. Um, I don't know how much you know about sort of the arc of what all has happened. Uh, I never set out to be a published author. Never uh, set out to write a work of fiction that would be on a bestseller list. Um, I've always written all my life, but, you know, stuff that everybody does. You write poems and songs and short stories, and you give them to your friends and family, and they, they think it's great because they're your friends and family, right? And, um, and for about four years, Kim had been, my wife Kim, had been saying to me, you know, someday as a gift for our kids, would you just, like, write something that puts in one place how you think, because you think outside the box, and uh, I didn't feel healthy enough to do it until the year I turned 50. And I was working three jobs, um, pretty minimum wage type stuff, but I was uh, doing shipping and receiving for a circuit board manufacturing company. I did all the janitorial, so I was cleaning toilets and stuff. And uh, I was a hotel night clerk, and, um, and I had 40 minutes each way on the train to one of my uh, three jobs, the main one. And I thought, all right, you know what? I'm finally healthy enough to do this, whatever this thing Kim's been asking me to do. And on the train, most of it on the train, I wrote a story, got it done for Christmas, made 15 copies at Office Depot on their photocopier, put a little plastic cover on it with a little spiral thing on the side to make it look cool. And uh, six went to our kids. We have six children. Uh, our youngest now is 23, and our oldest is 37. And um, I... They each got a copy for Christmas because I had nothing else to give them that year. Uh, we lived in a little rental house, 900 square feet, two and a half blocks away from Gresham High School in Gresham, Oregon. And um, uh, Kim got a job at the high school bakery there. And so we were just like in a season where we learned that the opposite of more is enough and that we'd been surrounded by enough our whole lives and didn't know it because we're always future tripping and imagining, you know, that the world was going to end in our lives or whatever. You know how you create imaginations that don't exist. And, um, and then you try to spend today's grace on them, you know. So we'd learned that not to do that anymore. And um, so six to the kids. Kim got a copy. The rest I gave to my friends. And I went back to work. A little book I wrote on the way is called The Shack. And um, uh, my friends start giving it away. You know, you give your kids a a book for Christmas and it's sort of like, uh, thanks, Dad. <laughs> like, we'll get right on that, you know? So it took them a while, but, um, but my friends started giving it away. We had to put a little collection together and make 15 more copies at Office Depot. And, uh, and it started getting in the hands of people that I didn't know, including three guys in California who wanted to make it into a movie, like the first time they read the manuscript. And that started the conversation about actually putting it into print, well, by the way, when it eventually got into print, um, Kim said to me, you know, when I asked you to do this, I was thinking like four to six pages, you know? <clears throat> and she didn't tell me that, but I wouldn't have changed it anyway. Um, so it starts to spill out. That starts a conversation about actually putting it into print. Um, uh, because if you can, here's the crazy thing. The average book, and I didn't know this for about two years after it was published, um, printed. Um, the average book only sells three to 5,000 copies in its entire existence. You know, 56% 56, 56 of all writers, that includes journalists and fiction writers and, you know, anybody that works in the writing industry, 56% cannot earn a living wage by writing. Just as a reality check here. Right? And so if you can sell a novel and sell 7,500 copies, you can put bestseller on it. Right? You can. I had no clue. I, I was told right from the very beginning, if we can get to 100,000 copies, Hollywood will come talk to us about a movie. There's more people than that in Portland. Right? Like, how hard can that be? Uh, well, I found out that this is... It's rare for a book to go over three to 5,000 copies. And 100,000 is like rarefied air. 
Um, that's why Hollywood will pay attention, because 65% of all successful movies are book adaptations. But they want to know that there's an audience out there before that they actually try to adopt uh, a book to screen, or adapt a book to screen. So um, uh, here, you know, but I, I never intended to be published, so I'm kind of like, all right, no expectations. Right? When you learn to live without expectations, everything's a gift. And so I'm just writing this whole thing. When we got it ready for publication, we sent it to 26 publishers, half of them Christian faith-based publishers, half of them mainstream secular press. And you got to understand, I'm, I'm from a modern evangelical fundamentalist background. I'm a missionary kid and a preacher's kid. And so I had further to go than most people and uh, trying to deal with the stuff in my own history and background. And... And here I am just, I'm at a place in my life where I'm finally, all right, I'm working three jobs. That's probably what I'm going to do the rest of my life. And I write a gift for my kids. And suddenly this crazy thing starts happening. Well, the publishers that were faith-based, they turned it down because it was too edgy. And the secular folks turned it down because it had too much Jesus in it. So I got stuck between edgy and Jesus, you know, and... Uh, Turns out there are millions of us stuck between edgy and Jesus, you know, so like how cool is that, you know, but nobody knew that. And, um, and I'd written a book for my kids to try to put inside of metaphor and fiction something that, that would tell my story. And they all knew my story, but, I, uh, but every human being is a story. And for us to begin to, to understand that, that your story matters, that who you are matters. And I, and I love fiction because it opens up space in a way that nonfiction doesn't. A lot of nonfiction is an attempt to close space down, whereas fiction or good art of any sort opens space up. Problem is, I'm from a Christian background, and we don't do very well at making good art. What we do is we turn it into propaganda or have an agenda, and as soon as you do that, you lose the art. And uh, it's, it's almost like we have to do it in order to justify the existence of art. And, and I'm, I'm not there anymore. That's the way I grew up, but I don't think that way anymore. And so I just wanted to write something that would be meaningful for my kids. Well, after 26 publishers turned it down, I, said, I asked this obvious question to me. Well, how hard is it to publish a book? So two of the guys that wanted to create the movie, two of the three created a publishing house. It's like 500 bucks for the state of California. And, and they were all in LA. And one of them volunteered to ship books out of his house at night because he's putting in people's sprinkler systems during the day. And uh, in May of 07, the local printer we found drop shipped, we ordered 10,000 copies, which you get a big price break at 10,000. But they drop shipped 10,000, actually 11,000, because there's this thing called overage where they're allowed to charge you for an extra 10% that they print by accident. And, uh, and, and in May of 07, 11,000 books landed at this guy's house. Drop shipped. That's, you know, what are you going to do? We have no marketing, no distribution. Nobody in the industry knows that we actually exist because they just made up this company, this publishing house. I was legal and all that. And um, so we set up a website and, and, you know, we gave a bunch of books away. And our goal was to get through 10,000, co no, 11,000 copies in two years, work our way up to 100,000, and then Hollywood would come talk to the guys about a movie. All right? I'm working my three jobs, so it's like, whatever. And, uh, and uh, three and a half months into this journey, I get a call from L.A., like, Paul, we need to order more books. And I go like, uh, are we just giving them all away? What are we doing? No, no, no. People are coming to the website and they buy one and then they come back and they buy five and then they come back and they buy cases. What? Well, how many do we order? So we ordered 20,000 and they delivered 22,000. And, uh, <laughs> right? Worked last time, right? And so we went through 22,000 books in 60 days. And then we went through 33,000 books in 30 days. And then the publishers started coming back and trying to track us down because people were showing up at Barnes & Noble and Lifeway and everywhere asking for the shack and being told, oh, it doesn't exist. 
Well, it's by this publisher. Well, it doesn't exist. <laughs> so they were backtracking to try to find us. In the first 13 months, from May of 07 to June of 08, end of June of 08, because at the end of June, the two guys who own the publishing house entered a joint venture with Hachette, the second largest publisher in the world, to take the book internationally. And in those 13 months, out of that uh, garage, two storage units, and the local printer, we spent less than $300 in marketing and advertising and shipped almost 1.1 million copies of the shack. I mean, we're brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> It was a God thing right from the very beginning. And, and the ripples of this started just to go out. Then it went internationally and became this unexpected phenomenon. It had never happened with a self-published book. And now it's, you know, it's in 50 languages. It's, it's in the top 100 best-selling fiction books of all history. Like, oh yeah, I totally knew what I was doing. You know what? It's so important that you understand this. 15 copies did everything I ever wanted that book to do. And everything that mattered to me was in place before I wrote the book. Identity, worth, value, significance, security, meaning, purpose, destiny, community, love. All in place before I wrote the shot. So that book has not added any of those things to me. But what it has done... It's opened up an invitation to step onto the holy ground of other people's stories. I mean, we could literally spend hours and hours talking about the stories that have come into my world because I wrote a story for my kids that God was kind enough to give to his. And, um, and out of that has come these ripples that have just affected the culture and the world. It's in, it's in every kind of barrier-breaking place you can imagine. And, um, and it's, it's been remarkable. But, but don't confuse me with someone who knows what they're doing. I'm like thrilled to be inside of this, but I don't need it. And the things that mattered to me were in place. Do you understand? So my identity doesn't come from this. My identity comes from my relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My sense of security comes, and my security in my life comes from that relationship. Jesus is at the center of everything for me. And it took a long time to get there. I got a, a lot of great sadness in my history that is reflected in the book. I had a writer from Nashville when I first, we sent the book out, and she wrote me and she said, you know, I don't know who you are or anything about you, but my sense is that Missy, and if you've read the book or seen the movie, you know that's Mackenzie's daughter who is murdered by a serial killer. And, and, and she, she said, my sense is that Missy represents you as a child. And something was murdered in you as a child, probably your innocence. And you as Mackenzie as the adult trying to deal with it. And that's true. I showed it to Kim and she, she says, boy, she nailed it. And we've had the losses in our lives. I mean, shock losses in our family. And, and things like that. But this really is the metaphor. Um, I'm a missionary kid. And sexual abuse was a part of my life inside the tribal culture before I was five years old. And when I was shipped out to boarding school at six, the big boys would come at night and molest the little boys. So this is not just made up coming out of nowhere. And I think part of the reason the book has had the impact that it has in the world is not only because it is so human and it asks such human questions, because I don't think there's any loss that is greater than the loss between a parent and a child, but it also has given people a language to have a conversation about God that's not a religious conversation. It's a relational conversation. And that has changed conversation around the world. So I wanted to give you this sort of big picture frame of reference to what we're talking about tonight and and I'm going to introduce my friends and they're going to tell you how we met and then we're going to open it up for whatever questions you have our context is do I belong and that has so many layers to it you know we could talk about do I belong inside my relationship with Jesus what if I am not behaviorally acting properly you know and and does sin separate me from God and all of those I and mean, the issue of belonging is huge to me Right? I'm, I'm a third culture kid. And if you know anything about 
missionary kids, you know, other than they always get in trouble without knowing why. Um, uh, we have a real issue with belonging because we ended up growing up in a culture that we thought we belonged to and then ended up in our passport culture, our parents' culture, and find out we didn't belong there. And by the time we got back to the culture we grew up in, we didn't belong there anymore either. And so the transitions that you go through are, are really difficult. Um, I was six before I found out I was white. <laughs> it was a huge disappointment. <laughs> I'm still kind of a little pissed about it, but just so you know. So, you know, my world is one in which the issue of belonging is a huge one. And um, that's why I wrote the second novel, Crossroads. It's all about the issue of belonging. I just used foster care instead of third culture kid and, um, with, that, with that issue. So in terms of my relationship with these two guys, and let me tell you, they're both brilliant theologians. They really are. And they're, and they're compassionate human beings. They're not interested in a theology that doesn't change your life or affect the way that you relate to not only yourself, but the people around you and to your enemy, right? This is real to us. We, we're not doing this because, oh, we like the attention. We're doing this because we love our relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's spilling out into everything that we do. So I'm going to... Let's see. I'm going to turn it to Baxter first, and he's going to tell you how we met, and then John's going to tell you how we met, because it's because of the way we met that they know each other and have become really close friends. Fight like married people, but, but you know. And, uh, and so, uh, it, and it's great. Now, Baxter is a Mississippi theologian and a storyteller, and uh, trained in Aberdeen, Scotland, but he's still got his southern accent. So uh, let me introduce Dr. Baxter Kruger. Thank you. Thank you. So Paul was saying I grew up in Mississippi, a uh, very, very conservative uh, Presbyterian background. Uh, I have a 13-year perfect Sunday school attendance pin in my little Presbyterian church. Uh, can you hear that better? Um, so a lot of church. And in all that church, I learned some basic verses that used to haunt me in a good way, like, you shall know the truth, and truth shall set you free. And I would sit in the pew on Sunday morning and read where Jesus says, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And I would read where Jesus talked about the kingdom of God within you, and I would think, well, what is that? I like, I, I'd like to have that. I didn't know it at the time. That was about 10 years, when I was about 10 years old, but that was become, going to become my life's quest. What is this truth that actually has the power to set me free? What is this river that flows out of my innermost being into my relationships and into my life? What is this kingdom? So that set me on a trajectory, and eventually I ended up in Scotland studying theology with Professor James B. Torrance because I had a feeling that he knew the answer to those questions, and he did. And he pointed me directly to not theology, but to Jesus as a person and to the early church. And I had always known that the subject of union with Christ was at the heart of this entire universe. Your life, mine, everyone else's. And I had wrestled with that. I did a lot of work on that theologically and historically and all that sort of stuff. We moved back from Scotland. I was working in a church. My son was about seven years old at the time. His two sisters were smaller. And it was a Saturday afternoon. And I was sitting in my den getting ready to watch a football match. Football. Ole Miss football game. And out of the corner of my eye, I see movement. I'm sorting through junk mail, and I look, and way over here in the corner, there is a door that goes back to our den and the rest of our house. And down at the very bottom, I would get down there, but you'd hear me moan getting back up. So just use your imagination. Down here, I see two camouflage faces painted in camouflage hats. It's my son and one of his buddies, and they're plotting my demise. And all of a sudden, I hear screaming, and these two camouflage blurs come flying through the air at me. And they're decked out in camouflage, head to toe. And the, the war is on. And there was uh, mock fistfights and grenades and all this going off. And I died a couple, three or four times and got resurrected and got back in, in the fight. 
But let me tell you, 10 minutes later, and that's all it was took was 10 minutes. I was, my son and his buddy were there in a ball of laughter, and I was like, <sighs> and I'm just there on, on a Saturday afternoon, and that happened. And I'm looking at my son and his buddy, and I get this ticker tape that goes across the front of my mind that says, Baxter, pay attention, this is important. And I'm like, okay. I have no idea why this is important. A, son, a, a dad and his, his two sons are playing army in the den, horsing around on a Saturday afternoon. This sort of thing's got to be going on all over the world. And I didn't get it. And I didn't get it until I began to realize that I actually did not know this other little boy at all. I had never seen him. And I thought, what would have happened if my son would have been in the back part of the house with our dog Nessie and his sisters, and this other little boy would have stepped into my den, camoed out, looked at me on the, on the couch. He probably would have thought, that's Mr. Kruger, but he actually wouldn't have known that for sure because we'd never met. And the last thing that's going to happen is for him on his own to come flying through the air and engage me in that kind of familiarity because he does not know me. He does not know what I'm like. He does not know how I'm going to respond to him. And as I thought about it, I began to realize, okay, my son was there. And my son knows me. And my son knows that I love him. And not only do I love him, I like him. And I want him to be with me. And in the freedom of my son's knowledge in my heart, he did the most natural thing in the world, which is to come fly through the air and engage his papa, his dad, in play. And his buddy was right there in the middle of it with him. And then it hit me what had happened in my den on that Saturday afternoon. I suddenly understood the gospel. I suddenly understood union. I watched my son's freedom with me go inside that other little boy. I watched my son's assurance, my son's the little boy, and he got to taste and feel and experience it. He got to play in it. It was as much his as it was ours. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. Jesus is the one that knows the Father, and he knows that we don't, and we live our lives running around in fear, and he says, I'm going to share with you what I know. I'm going to put my eyes inside of you. I'm going to give you my heart, my spirit, and you're going to see what I see. So from that moment forward, my life was on a trajectory where I'm trying to write about this in such a way that people can understand. And I wrote a little book called Across All Worlds uh, at the same time, when Paul and I didn't know each other at all, that he was writing The Shack. And my friend Tim Purcell, who is now a pastor in Baltimore, but at the time he was in Virginia. This is 2007. And I sent a copy to Tim and he read it, and he read The Shack right after that, and then he fires off an email to Paul Young and says, I don't know if you know Baxter, but he's my friend and he's written a book that basically has got the theology that goes with your book, The Shack. And I guess he put my phone number on there. So anyway, in the meantime, meantime, I get a, a week earlier, I get a phone call from a lady from Sault Ste. Marie, Canada named Wendy Marchant. And she says, she gets on the phone. She's one of these kind of ladies that's in charge. She really does have a hotline. The Father, Son, and Spirit really do listen to her very carefully. <laughs> she said, Baxter, I'm not getting off the phone. Do you promise to read a book? And I said, Wendy, um, I know I'm from Mississippi, but I promise we read books down here. <laughs> and she said, and I said, some of us can even write. And uh, she said, you know what I mean? And I said, well, what's the book called? And she says, called The Shack. And I said, The Shack. Okay. And she said, Promise me you'll read it. I said, I started not to promise. And I said, okay, I'll put it on top of my deer stand reading pile. So I have this deer stand that my, my brother-in-law and I built called the Cadillac stand. It's got carpet and a tin roof, and it's got chairs way nicer than this, these that lean back and roll around. So I do most of my writing in the Cadillac stand. So I said, I'm going to put it on top of the stack. And sure enough, November 21st, opening day of season, I've got my backpack. i got the shack in it. I sit down. I walk into the deer stand, and I sit down in the Cadillac stand, lean back, put my feet up, and grab the shack. And I start reading, and I get into the part about Missy. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm not. 
And then I stood up, about chapter four, chapter three and a half, right in there. And I stood up and I said, William P. Young, I have no idea who you are, but I promise you that if you hand to me the same old faceless, nameless omni being up there somewhere, watching us from the infinite distance of a disapproving heart as the answer to this gut-wrenching problem that you set up in your book, that I'm going to take your little book and I'm going to walk 200 yards down this path and lean it against a tree and I will personally eliminate this copy from the cosmos. <laughs> Needless to say, I was not pleased when he, and then all of a sudden Papa comes out the door and I'm going, oh my goodness me. This brother has met Jesus' father. I've got it. So I've tried to read the rest of the book and I was reading with a flashlight in my mouth right at dark when my son texted me and said he was back at the camp. So that night, Friday night, I finished it. Is that better? Can you hear me? If you can't hear me, you probably can't understand a word I'm saying anyway, but just, <laughs> just smile like my mother does. And, here, and here's what you say. Bless his heart. <laughs> Bless his heart. So where was I? Oh, Friday night. I get... They're giving mics just all kinds of mics. Well, we... But never mind. <laughs> I was going to say something about electricity in Oregon, about uh, Washington, but I'll wait. Um, so, I get home and I finish the shack that night. That's a Friday night. And in Sunday afternoon, uh, my son and I are watching a football game. Uh, Eli Manning, graduate of the University of Mississippi, uh, and I get a phone call, and, and I look at my phone, and it's a 503 number, and that's not an area code that we're familiar with at all. And I ask him, I said, what, do you know where 503 area code? He said, no. I said, well, something told me to answer. Uh, and I did. And I, I said, hello, this is Baxter. And this voice on the other end said, Baxter, this is Paul Young. And I'm like, okay, Paul Young. I don't know a Paul Young. Um, but it's William P. Young on, on the, the original, the first edition. It's William Paul on the second one. So William P. Young, and I don't know a Paul Young, and I'm trying to go through the Rolodex in my head, for those of you that even know what that is. Oh. <laughs> Who is this guy? Where did I meet him? We probably sat on a plane together somewhere and talked about something. And so I could tell he doesn't, that he knows that I don't know who he is, and so I did the little southern thing. So how's your mom and them doing? And... Anyway, we finally, I finally realized, I said, is, are you William Paul Young? And he said, that, yeah. I said, the William Paul Young? And he said, no, no. I'm, I said, did you write The Shack? Like the best book that's been written in the last 500 years. And he said, he said that was me. I said, why in the world are you calling me? I said, the whole world wants to talk to you. And he said, well, your friend Tim Brassell told me that you had written a book that goes with the shack, and so I thought I would call. And so I ran out to the garage, uh, and so I could hear and, uh, over the football game, and I had like 50,000 questions. But my number one question that I asked Paul was, please tell me, please tell me that you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit on the inside of the shack, which is... Mackenzie's soul, his brokenness, they're already on the inside before he has repented and believed and won the victory at all. And I could, I could hear his answer without any words. I could, hear him, I could hear him smiling on the other end, and he finally said, of course. I said, I have to understand how you came to understand that. I, would you tell me that story? So that became the basis of a long conversation that day, which eventually led into uh, a lot more conversations and uh, books and eventually led to meeting John McMurray. Does your mic work? <laughs> yes, it does. I'm going to sit. So, I was born in Panama. Moved to the States when I was young, so I don't remember much of it. And my father was really, really strict and conservative. 
because he had become a believer when he was uh, like almost 40. I, f- I came to find out that my dad was like the number one party animal in, in Panama. You have to know a bit of the history of Panama. You are probably ever hear of a guy named Noriega? Okay, a couple of people have. <laughs> anyway, um, forget that. But he became a Christian, and, and in his view and the way he looked at life, he became very strict and conservative because he didn't want his kids to go down the path that he'd gone down. So I was the youngest of three, and my older brother and my older sister rejected pretty much everything my dad wanted for us. Like, he made us go to church, you know, as long as you live here. I remember, actually, I was ready to leave the house. I was going to run away from home. Um, but I told them I was going to run away from home. You don't tell your parents you're going to run away from home. You just go. Right? But I told them, and my mom's pleading, don't go, don't go. And my dad is like, yeah, okay, go ahead and go. We'll see how long it takes for you to come back. Right? And, um, but it was, it was because we, he forced his beliefs on us in a way that he basically used God as his big stick. And my dad was into control. Now, I'm not trying to badmouth my father. I'm just saying that's, that's the environment that I grew up in. I inherited that, and I find in my life, uh, even today, times where I default to want to control. And, um, but that's what I grew up with. So uh, I remember my junior year of high school, which isn't that far removed from where some of you are right now, a couple years, and at the time, uh, pot wasn't legal in Philadelphia, which is where I was living. I don't think it was legal anywhere, maybe Amsterdam. But I would smoke pot on the way to church because I lived close enough that we, I could walk. And I'd walk to church and I'd get high. And I'd sit in the pew, um, pretty much stoned. And I would go through songs in my head. Like, I, this is honest. I'd look at my watch. I knew how long the song was. So let's say the song was seven minutes and 30 seconds. I'd look, I'd start, and I'd start the song in my head. And I'd go through the whole song, and then I'd look at my watch to see how close I was if I missed any parts of it. And then I'd do the next song. I, I can't tell you how many times I did it. I did a lot. That's, that's kind of where I was with God, church, and everything. Because I, I saw all of it as simply an extension, extension of my dad trying to control my life. Between my junior and senior year of high school, uh, some dramatic things happened. One of them was I got busted. (laughs) So uh, they threatened to tell my dad that, okay, that just came on. Okay, now you can hear me. Um, They threatened to tell my dad, and that was the last thing in the world, because I didn't want to spend my entire senior year of high school grounded. You know, I thought my senior picture would be like a mugshot from the police station, you know, with, with the numbers in front of me, and I have this pathetic look on my face, you know, like that's my senior year of high school. So they made a deal with me, deal with me, that if I'd listen to what they have to say, we'd, we'd visit the question of whether we tell your parents or not. Well, long story short, um, I had an experience where I believed that I met Jesus, at the time, I, th- I thought that that meant I was going to Bible college. I actually, that's what I thought. I thought that meeting Jesus was the same thing as going to Bible college. So I graduated from high school. I went to Bible college for four years. I graduated from college, and I thought the thing that I was supposed to do uh, was to go into ministry. So I did. I was a youth pastor for another four years. And at that time, the pastor of the church said, you need to go to seminary. Um, you guys all know what a seminary is, right? So, and they he kicked me out. Now, I'm living in Philadelphia area at the time, so I applied to a bunch of different schools, and one of the schools I applied to was in Portland, Oregon. And I'd always wanted to go to Oregon. In fact, in my days when I used to get stoned, I wanted to go to Oregon because I wanted to get as far away from my dad as I could. And it was the other side of the country. And, uh, So I ended up coming to Portland, Oregon to go to grad school, and I graduated from there, and then I went and taught in the Bible college that I graduated from. (laughs) 
it came full circle, and that was just really had no idea that my life would ever go in that direction. So years go by, um, and I'm disenchanted a little bit with ministry as a job. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not legitimate, it's not good, or anything like that. But for me, I became disenchanted in that. And when I had moved to Oregon, I became very interested in the outdoors. So I really began to hike a lot. The church that I had left, that I was, where I was a youth pastor, gave me a camera as a going-away gift. There's irony here because for the last 30 years, I have been a professional nature photographer. That's what I do for a living. And during that time, I've taught at several different Bible colleges part-time. Because I don't want that job full-time. I'm happy to do that pretty much for free. I make a living taking pictures all over the world. So I get to go where you want to go for vacation and take pictures of it, and I get paid for it. That's a really good job, by the way. And uh, my son didn't like that job when I was growing up. Now that he's out of college, he always wants to go wherever I go. So something happened, something shifted there. Um, But that's what I did. So I'm teaching a Sunday school class in 2007, and this is in September, this time of year, 10 years ago. And I was teaching a class on the Gospel of John, and I got done the class. A man came up to me afterwards and said, have you ever heard of this book called The Shack? Nope. He said, well, a local guy wrote it. He lives here, because I live right outside of Portland, not far from Gresham. Paul mentioned that's where he was living. And I said, well, I, I don't know him. He goes, well, you sound like the book. Okay. I didn't know what that meant. I, you know, I probably forgot it within minutes of having that conversation, which is what I do with most conversations. So if I do that to you, I apologize ahead of time. I'm just, that's, I'm getting old. Anyway, uh, the next week I come back to teach the last class, and then on Monday I'm leaving on an autumn photo shoot to go from Oregon through Idaho Colorado, Utah, Nevada, back to Oregon. Get done the class, he comes up to me, he's got the book in his hand. And he says, this is the book I was talking about. And I have no idea what book he was talking about. He says, no, this is the book I told you about. And then I remember, oh yeah, you told me about the book last week. So I looked at it, I said, that's great. He goes, no, you should read this. And I go, okay, and I gave it back to him. He goes, no, you keep it. So again, this is really funny, because the only way you could get the book was on a website, and the only place you could find out about the website was in the book. (laughs) Think about it. So, brilliant marketing strategy. strategy. So, I take it, and uh, I take it with me on my trip. I'm about halfway the trip. I'm in Moab, Utah. Anybody here been to Moab? All right. You know how spectacular it is. And I'd been up early that morning shooting the sunrise in Arches National Park. And because it was really early, I went back. Because that night I'd gotten a hotel instead of sleeping in a tent. I went back to sleep. Got up about 11 o'clock and was really hungry. Left the hotel. Went across the street to Moab Brewery. If you've been to Moab, you know where Moab Brewery is because it's the only brewery in town. And I went there to get some lunch. And as I was walking in, I remembered, oh, that book. So I went back to the car, grabbed the book, went into the restaurant, sat down and ordered lunch. I left at 6 o'clock. I sat there and read the whole book that afternoon in about five and six and a half hours. I'm a slow reader. I cried like four or five times in the restaurant. And after the first couple times, I didn't care. The first couple times, I was really embarrassed. And I'm trying to hide it with my napkin, and I'm looking down, and I'm blowing my nose, and acting like I have a cold and all that kind of stuff. You know, guys, how that goes, right? Because you're not supposed to cry. And after the second time, I didn't care. I just sat there, and and I'm weeping. And what I'm weeping about is because I'm reading something that's articulating something that I've struggled to try and say for years. And it was the beauty, the absolute stunning beauty of who God is in the relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit and the way that they relate to each other. And here I am, I have gone through college and seminary, I've taught in Bible schools for decades, and the God that I've taught my students about is a God who is a singularity, 
He's a God who's isolated. He's a God who's distant. He's a God who's up there. So when I would pray, I had an individual in mind. When I thought of Adam and Eve in the garden, if I thought it was a literal thing, I had Adam walking with another person. It never occurred to me that Adam might be with three other persons. It never occurred to me that God is one, but it is three persons. And that what is the essence of his nature is that he is relationship. So for me, truth was abstract. The gospel was a proposition. It was a transaction you make with God. It was a deal. He bought it. You take it or you don't, and you get to ride the train to heaven or not. So relationship didn't even enter my vocabulary other than my entire life I had heard that what made Christianity unique from all world religions was that it said eternal life is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And then they said that, and then I said that, and then it disappeared. Literally disappeared off the radar from anything I thought or taught. Now that's a huge case, case of cognitive dissonance. I mean, I, I was completely disconnected from what I had been grown up to believe. I'd been taught that God was Trinity, but it made no sense to me, so I just ignored it at best. So I get home from the trip, and um, in, in the back of the book, um, Paul had done some acknowledgments, like most authors do, and one of the people that he acknowledged was Donald Miller. Now, I understand that in Kent's class, you guys are reading Blue Like Jazz, right? Okay. Donald lived in our home for four years. The stories I could tell you about Donald Miller. <laughs> Seriously, I, can, I bribe him all the time. And uh, he had a pet weasel. No. Ferret. He had a pet ferret that died, and he couldn't find it. For several days. That's a good story. Anyway, so he had acknowledged that he had read Donald, and so I decided to do something I'd never done before, and that was I decided to write an author. I'd never written an author before, but this guy was local, and so I decided to do that. And I wrote him a short email, because the email was at the back of the book, and said, Hey, I'm local. You mentioned Donald Miller, he's a good friend of ours. I really appreciated your take on the Trinity. I would love to get together and talk if you have some time. I sent it. My wife, Terry, she's around here somewhere, but <clears throat> she was in the office with me. And about 10 minutes later, my phone rings. I answer it. Hello? Hi. Is this John McMurray? Yes, it is. This is Paul Young. I just wrote you. I know. That's how I got your number. I <laughs> You see, like, if you put all of our brains together, we're, we're pretty, yeah, we're pretty good. So, so I said, oh, man. He goes, yeah. He says, I would love to get together. I said, great. It was about 1030 in the morning. That's when I start working. No, that's, that's not true. And um, he said, what are you doing for lunch? Like, you mean like in an hour, hour and a half? Yeah, what are you doing for lunch? He said, nothing. Well, let's meet for lunch. Where do you work? I work here. Well, let's meet at McMinimins, Clackamas. Okay. So we met at McMinimins in Clackamas. Walk in, gives me a big hug. I said, I got a question for you. I said, you know, I've been teaching the Bible most of my life, and so I know the story's fiction, but tell me, like, kind of biblically speaking, because you have so much, you know, God stuff in there and theology and all that. Like, what, where in the, oh, that's an easy question. John 13 through 17. I said, I knew it. Had to be. Had to be. That the, this was part of the birthplace of some of, of his thoughts about the nature of who the Father, Son, and Spirit are. So we get to become friends, and we're talking, we're meeting, and we're having coffee in Gresham at a place called Cafe D. I don't drink coffee either to see, so I'm not sure why we met there. Oh, you drink chai tea. So he tells me, hey, have you heard of this guy named Baxter Kruger? No. He goes, he really loves the Gospel of John like you do. Okay, great. I have a book of his. You should read it. So he runs out in his pickup truck, comes in, gives me the book. I go home. I read it, and I'm stunned. I'm like, okay. There, there, honestly, there were paragraphs that, again, you're talking about someone who's now over 50 who's been reading theology now for 35 years almost. 
And I'm reading paragraphs, and I have to read them over and over again because I'm going, okay, if this is true. And so Paul and I meet a couple weeks later, and he says, what would you think of the book? I said, it was great. I said, I'd love to talk with him. I got a million questions. Oh, I'm doing a conference with him in a couple months. Would you like to go? Yeah, I'd love to go. He calls him up. You want to, I want to bring this guy with me. Bring him. So I flew down to Jackson, Mississippi. God, I don't know what came over me on that. But no. It was the grace of God. <laughs> I'm purgatory. Anyway, so I, I go to Jackson, and I meet Baxter. He gives me a big hug. He's cooking crawfish. And we stay up till 3 in the morning talking about John. And that's how we became friends. And that was back in... When I met Baxter was spring, April of 2008. And then since then, the two of them have been a part of school theology pretty much every year. It's a little one-week intensive that I do where we bring in authors and speakers to meet with about 20 people, and they have a week to just process some things. But the thing that... There were several things. I, I, th- I like to think of them, you guys, as dominoes. And one of them, for me, when I was in college that was a domino that I didn't know was a domino at the time, was I had this uh, part of my personality was, was such that justice was extremely important to me. And so this was how I was able to rationalize that God could do what I believed God did. And they weren't, they were not good things. But I rationalized that because God has to do that because he has to be just. And so that was a huge domino that actually started to fall over when I was in college because the thought occurred to me like, okay, wait a minute. If if God is just, then he can't forgive because the moment he forgives, he's not being just. And I would ask my profs and they would talk and it was double talk. And so what happened was it created this huge question that I knew, I knew that my, my paradigm didn't answer. And it lay there dormant for decades. And eventually there were things that happened that I read, that I encountered. Primarily I encountered Jesus in me that kicked that domino over and things started to fall as a result. So, yeah, so one of, the, one of the biggest dominoes for all three of us has been the idea of separation. The idea that, that you are powerful enough that you can separate yourself from God. And so I want Baxter to speak to that. <laughs> See, this is what's great about introducing a, a question, right? You could just give somebody else the responsibility of, yeah. of dealing with it. But I know this is a big topic that we talk about a lot, and we're going to be talking about it a lot at Open Table Conference. And uh, but the fundamental issue of separation. And after he gives you this brief answer, (laughs) we want to open it up to you because we're we're beginning to run out of time, and we want to open it up to whatever you'd like to ask or comment on. Right, which can be about something we've said, or about our stories, or about the movie, or about uh, whatever, theology, whatever you'd like. So. So what am I supposed to be talking about? Separation. Oh. Is that like a divorce? Or? <laughs> yeah. It's like that. Now, Paul, one time I had spoken and Paul got up to speak and I, I sat down and I was kind of relaxing. And uh, he gets This talking. is him getting back at me right now, just so you know. Well, and so he, he calls me back up on the stage and says, Baxter, come up here and tell him the story about the dog. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what story? <laughs> he knows my stories better than I do. I couldn't remember. So what story? So, Anyway, it's not about separation, but I will tell the story about the dog on Friday night. Okay. It's a great story. A miraculously healed duck dog. But um, for me, uh, of course, I was taught in my Presbyterian world that um, the whole human race is separated from God by sin, and Jesus has come to sort of cross over the Great Divide, and those of us that want to uh, can walk across the Great Divide and get to Jesus and get to to the Father and be accepted. That was the way I thought about it. Uh, One of the sticking points for me happened to be John 1, uh, 1, 2, and 3. 
and Colossians 1.16 and Hebrews 1 and, and other passages in the New Testament because, and this has been the most amazing part of my journey, is to see that for the, the disciples of Jesus, John and Paul in particular, they begin to understand that Jesus is actually the creator of everything. And to make that move theologically within their world of rigid uh, uh, monotheism, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, that's it. There's no deviation, there's no room. But yet they knew that Jesus was God, and they worshipped him. And then he had one he called the Father, and then was this wonderful, mysterious person in the middle called the Holy Spirit. And so what you see happening in, in Saul of Tarsus' mind in the New Testament, in his writings, and you see it happening in John's mind, is they begin to realize that what they've encountered in the person of Jesus is in actual fact the creator of all things. And so that's what John says in, in the third verse of his gospel, that all things came into being by him, and apart from him nothing has come into being that has come into being. And I you know, would think, well, that doesn't mean all things. He doesn't mean everything. Uh, and it's like, yes, that's exactly why he repeated himself. Because he knew, he knew there would be people like me that says, well, you don't really mean everything because there's bunches of people on planet Earth that have not prayed a prayer or had not done what I was told in that particular group within conservative Protestantism you had to do to be able to move across the divide. But well, here's the gospel for me. I've come to see, and I, I love this. I can't sit down and say this. The gospel is not the news that we can receive Jesus Christ into our lives. The gospel is the news that Jesus Christ has received you into his life. And that was a kaleidoscope moment for me. I thought, oh my goodness me, Jesus is way bigger than I thought he was. He is the Lord. I'm not separated from him. He's come and found me in the far country of my darkness and laid hold of me. And the Holy Spirit is, is trying around the clock uh, I now understand from the moment I was conceived to wake me up to what is real. And so I see separation as one of the fundamental uh, breakdowns in our entire Western family conversation, both Protestant, Catholic, across the board. When you assume separation, you have to get back to God. Then how do we know which way to get back to God is the right way? You pick your way, you pick your way, you pick yours, and before long we're all arguing about being right, and none of us can begin to see the staggering thing that the Father, Son, and Spirit have pulled off, whether we see it yet or not. We will see it, because the Holy Spirit's determined that the truth be known. But that was what was a revolution in my journey, was realizing that there was a truth that's true about me before I make it so. And so faith is not something I do to get me across the divide. Faith is fundamentally a discovery that Jesus has laid hold of me in my darkness, in my brokenness, in my sin, and he will never let me go. And now what he says to me every day, and this is my way of talking about it, is Baxter, you can live in your own world today if you want to, and you can see things the way you see them, and you can try to convince everybody from your wife and your kids to your friends to see things the way you see them, or you can take sides with me and let me teach you who the Father really is. Let me teach you who the Holy Spirit really is, and that's been a, an amazing journey for me, and let me teach you who you are. And I promise you, Baxter, and this is repentance for me, metanoia, I promise you, if you'll begin to believe that I'm in you and you're in me, I will take you places that you can't conceive of right now in your confusion. Trust me. Walk with me. So the gospel is not the news that, that we can receive Jesus. The gospel is the news he's received us, and he's asking us to believe that with him and walk with him. So that's about as quick as I can yeah, get there. I know. And, and it's not a new idea. This is grounded in the early church. This is what they would have proclaimed. Irenaeus and Athanasius and, and all the early mothers and fathers. John wants to say something. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I can see it in okay. your eyes. Let's turn it over to your questions, and uh, you can aim it at anybody or all of us or whatever. Um, I'll repeat it. Yeah. The members of the Trinity? Yeah. yeah. 
So the question is about the personification of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, right from day one, God the Father was a large black African-American woman. And, uh, and it, part of it is, is that I grew up in the box where God was Gandalf with a bad attitude. <laughs> right? <laughs> the, one of the fundamental problems in my world is that most of the damage in my life and in the, in the world as a global community have come from men. And a lot of our theology has been so masculine-centered. And, and frankly, my journey into the Trinity um, uh, came from the issue of women. That's where it originated. Because one of the fundamental questions in my life was, if, if we relate to women this way, and frankly, women had been so much more healing in my life than the men in my life were. And if we relate to women in a hierarchical sort of way, power downward, subordination, all of that, not recognizing the full face-to-faceness of the personhood of half the entire population on the planet. If we do that, it has to have a basis within the Trinity. There has to be a hierarchy in the Trinity. And if you do any study on that question by itself, you'll find out that every single tradition in Christianity, whether it's Catholic, Protestant, or Orthodox, have declared that the idea of hierarchy in the Trinity is a heresy, a for real one, a huge mistake, right? There is no hierarchy in the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the technical phrase is the eternal subordination of the Son to the Father. That is a mistake, which means that in the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you don't have a separation between roles or any of that kind of stuff. There is this, and Baxter's, community that he works, perichoresis, which was the early church word for the trying to describe the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's mutual interpenetration without the loss of personhood, right? This is the great dance that was pictured by the early church when they're trying to find language, struggling to find language to describe the beauty of the relationship between the three persons who make the oneness of God. And, um, and then there is the whole issue of imagery doesn't define God. Imagery doesn't define God. Because God is all kinds of different imagery throughout Scripture. He's, God's a burning bush. God's, God's a rock. God's a shield, a strong tower, a mother bear in Habakkuk, a nursing mother in Isaiah, right? Uh, God has a womb in John 1. Father, the Father has a womb, Kolpon. And uh, it's not translated that because guys translated the Bible. So it's not a womb, it's a bosom. <laughs> right. So <laughs> there's a difference between a bosom and a womb, just so you know. And, and, and when you're introduced to the Holy Spirit in verse 2 of Genesis, the language is all feminine. You know that most of the nouns related to God in the Hebrew scriptures are masculine, but almost all the verbs are feminine. Right? When you deal with the word mercy that dominates the, the scriptures, the word mercy comes from the same root as the word womb. You're dealing with the womb love of God. And so that raises all kinds of questions, but it was this issue of women. So when I'm, you got to remember, I wrote this story for my kids. I don't want them growing up being afraid of Gandalf with a bad attitude because that's the God I grew up with. As Baxter says, that distant omni being, the darkness behind Jesus, right, that, the, that Jesus came to save me from. That being is the one that requires sacrifice and all this stuff. So I'm trying to find a way to write the imagery of God that breaks the boxes that we put God into. And the way that I did it was that Papa was a large black African-American woman. Woman. And, and I have those women in my life who've had a profound impact in my life. I actually built the personification for Papa off of a friend of mine named Renee Greenwich. So that was one. Jesus was easy. Huh? He gets to be himself, right? Although that's really ticked off a bunch of my people. My people, evangelical fundamentalists who won't read the book and don't like it, you know? We're all about being right. And those are my people, and I love my people. Um, but I know how they think. 
So I, I even had five, uh, I think it's five emails where I've gotten emails and they say, how dare you make Jesus a Middle Easterner? <laughs> you know, when you get somebody angry, you're suddenly not sure of yourself. You have to go check. Are Jews Middle Easterners? Yeah, they're Middle Easterners. <laughs> you know, one of the most beautiful things is that Aviva Lush, Avraham Aviva Lush plays Jesus in the movie, and he's from Tel Aviv. He's a Jewish actor, right? Who would have thought having Jesus played by a Jew? I mean, it was like, <laughs> we think it's the first time, actually. He doesn't have a British accent, doesn't have the blue eyes, and, and um, you know, so, so Jesus was, that personification was easy. And um, then the Holy Spirit. One is I'm drawing from the Hebrew context. I'm also drawing from the fact that the oldest manuscript evidence we have in the New Testament, called the Syriac, when they referred to the Holy Spirit in John 14 through 17, the fragments that we have, Jesus says and refers to the Holy Spirit as she. Now, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is the feminine part of God. That's not what we're saying. But it also doesn't mean when Scripture talks about God as Father that that means the Father is masculine. All of the entire spectrum of masculinity and femininity originate in the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. Right? That's, well, you're made in the image and likeness of God, and it's male-female. So that's what I'm trying to get at in that. So the Holy Spirit, the Holy, and I won't tell you... At this point, I won't tell you where the name came from, but it's a beautiful name. And Sariu is the way the, the name is in, that I wrote. And, um, but I picked an Asian woman because I grew up in Asia, and Asian women are always promoting others. They, they tend to not promote themselves. And I see that everywhere with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is always saying, look at the Father or look at Jesus, you know. And, and, uh, and, and so it worked for me. Um, Asian women also show up where you don't expect them and they know everything. So <laughs> that worked too. So those were some of the contexts in which I, I picked the personification. But again, this is imagery. The, the thing that really uh, flipped a light, because I went to Bible school and seminary. It's not like I'm ignorant about these things. But when I studied the Trinity in seminary and in Bible school, it was always some kind of an analogy. Three parts of water, three parts of an egg. You know, it's, it's like, but the thing about all of those analogies is they're non-relational. They're non-relational. And all I did is describe them in relationship one to the other, and the lights went on for so many people from so many different traditions. And I think that was... That was a huge surprise. It wasn't something I was trying to set out to do. I'm just trying to, to tell a story inside the world as I now see it, as someone who is old enough to have traveled this distance down the religious path. So there was a question. Yeah. Uh, can I ask one? Yes. Uh, maybe Baxter. Well, the, to me, and I, that's what I grew up in. I mean, um, very much very conservative Calvinist tradition. Well, that's my world. That's what I grew up with, and and, and um, for me, the that John one three, and reading the early church fathers like Irenaeus, and Athanasius, and Gregory Nazianzus, these are the men that uh, had such a profound influence on the Nicene Creed, and then defended it, and developed our basic concept of the Trinity, is that all things were created in 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 and through and by and for Jesus. Now, that's Bible. I mean, they, they picked up that language and developed it. So for me, the idea of separation, uh, for me, was I realized, wait a minute, how do I hold separation and hold John 1, 3 together at the same time? All things came into being by him, and apart from him, not one thing came into being. So what I did was I looked up Calvin. And I'm thinking, well, he's going to sort this through. Well, then you read Calvin on John 1, 3 and 1, 4, and he says that um, if Jesus withdrew himself from any of us, we would disappear and lapse into non-being. And that's the same thing that you read in Athanasius and Irenaeus, and you read it in Thomas Merton, and you read it in, in, across the spectrum. So I'm thinking, wait a minute. 
So there is some relationship here, our existence, that is, it comes from Jesus, and not just uh, in the sense of an ever-ready energizer bunny. Like Jesus created us, gave us a battery pack, and off we go, and he can go that way. We could still do, there's not a, there's not a break here. And I th- the analogy that came to me was a child with soap bubbles, blowing soap bubbles. You know, dipping the wand and blowing little bubbles. And you could say the child, Jesus, creates the soap bubbles. He breathes into them. And then once they're detached, they're floating out on their own. Well, as a student of historical theology, I'm like, that's like Arianism. (laughs) That, because what the New Testament is saying is that there is no disconnect. We continue to have, to live and move and have our being. Calvin again on on Acts 17. Uh, we continue to live and move and have our being in Jesus Christ. So that becomes the core bed of the gospel for me. And so now I see that that changed, um, that really changed in uh, my understanding of the nature of faith and repentance. And uh, for those, any of you know the name of Louis Burkhoff? Y'all know that name at all? You know him. Well, Louis Burkhoff was, was the theologian that we studied in seminary. Uh, he wrote a book called Systematic Theology on page 447. Uh, bottom right of that page, if you, I'm sure you've got it in your library, you'll see where he says, and this, this surprised me, but he says that the difference between Reformed tradition and Lutheran tradition is that in the Lutheran tradition, union with Christ comes as the fruit of our faith. And so it comes under the heading of soteriology. In the Reformed tradition, union with Christ comes first in eternity in the council of the Trinity of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Second, it is established in the incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Third is when we begin to perceive and understand it. So he says, faith does not create union with Jesus. Our faith is the first fruit of his union with us. So this was good Reformed theology to me. So I wasn't prepared for some of the pushback, as you're saying, about some of that. So I take my stand right there in the Nicene Creed, because it's pretty emphatic that Jesus is not only of the same being as the Father, but all things came into being through him, and apart from him, not one thing came into being. So my question is, what are we actually saying? Are we actually saying to people when we say you're separated from God that you got here some way other than Jesus? And I'm like, oh, that's not what I'm going to say. So it's faith and repentance is not something we do that gets us across. The fundamental a component of faith is discovery. It's like going from being a blind person to suddenly seeing. And when you start seeing it, you're not creating what you see. You're discovering it. And then you're asking, are you going to believe this and walk in it? Another, yeah. another way to put this is that's, that's helpful for me is to ask the question, where do you think creation was created? That's the same as Baxter was talking about the soap bubble. Is creation created outside of God? Well, there is nothing outside of God. Creation is created inside. In fact, and he's saying it's not only inside the circle of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it's in Christ. Not anything that has come into being has come into being apart from him. And so your existence is because you're created in Christ. And then you've got Romans staying, saying things like, let me tell you all the things that cannot separate you from the lo- love of God. And in that is anything present, anything future, not death, not life, nor any created thing. You would be a created thing. You do not have the power to separate yourself from the love of God. You can turn your face from it. You can ignore it. You can choose your darkness. But it doesn't change the truth that you cannot separate yourself from the love of God. You're just not that powerful. John, go. Um, I think one of the reasons to, to revisit the question that Ken is asking is because we feel like we're separated. That's what we feel like. And the, here's, the, here's how this fleshes out for me. If I believe that I'm separated, if that's really the truth, what it means is that this, the answer to this question, do I belong? I can't answer that question until I've jumped through the appropriate religious hoop to get in. In other words, I have to do something in order to belong. I have to do something in order to be embraced by the Father, Son, and Spirit. You know, and this religion will say it's these things, and this one will say you need to believe this. They're all different, but you, it still is up to you. It still is, it's on your back. 
And so, because I feel like I'm separated, most religious people spend their entire life, until they get so tired of it, they chuck it. Mm. They spend their entire life trying to get accepted, trying to feel like they, em- they belong, trying to feel like they're embraced. But the truth is, you are embraced. You yes. always will be embraced. And so I live my life not trying to get embraced. I live my life because I am. I live my life out of that reality. So I think of it this way. My son's here, and he graduated from here a year ago. And he was our firstborn. And when Chris was born, um, I go down C-section because he was really big. And uh, I go down into the nursery and I lay eyes on my son for the first time. And at that moment, as a father, I experienced something I had never experienced before. I loved this human being, and they had never, he had not done anything to win my love. But I would have stood in front of a train for him right then, right there. And I would do it every day since, and I will always do it. I will never change. He will always be my son. I will always be his father. And he, has, he doesn't have to do anything to be embraced by me. Now, if I as a human being am fallen and broken, and I'm struggling with do I belong, and I can love someone else like this unconditionally, unilaterally, am I a better father mm. than God? Mm. Come on. See, this is where my theology took me, and that's why I said, okay, something's wrong here. I'm not a better dad than God. Mm. So... There's, there's ramifications here. It's not, just, it's not just discussion of theology. It's the way we live in terms of, well, of everything. But the questions that matter to us of belonging and significance and meaning. Jesus has answered these. And he's not saying to you, well, if you do the right things, I'll give you the answer. Okay? So I, ho- I hope that makes sense. One quick note, Um, it just so happens that last week um, I posted a a new blog that's three pages, three and a half pages on, it's called A Note on Union with Christ, and I I spent three pages working through this as carefully as I could, Um, so if you'll get that information on our website, uh, perrycreases.org, Baxter's blog, Um, and it's really interesting because already a bunch of people have been uh, uh, making comments. about it, but it seems to me that what we forget so often is that the the clear testimony of Scripture is that Jesus is not only the Father's eternal Son, He is also the Creator and Sustainer of all things before He even becomes a human being, and that's been left out of the equation. I'm bringing it back in, and I think that's what Calvin was doing actually. Yeah. And we realize that okay, this opens up all kinds of cans of worms. I mean, the questions are just like profoundly broad and all that. And that's why we do Open Table, is to talk about it. So what does this mean about judgment? What does this mean about hell? What does this mean about, you know, uh, are you a universalist? You know, I get all that kind of stuff. And it's, these are great points of conversation and questions that we need to have, we need to talk about as a community of faith. And that's, that's why we do this, so that we can have those conversations. We don't have all the answers, but we're going to tell you what it's been like in our journeys and why what we're talking about has brought healing and coherence to our lives where the theology that we grew up with never was able to deliver. It didn't put us back together. I thought growing up that I had to die before I could experience wholeness, you know, that that was my only way out. And, so, and death became both my damnation and my salvation, which is like, that's got to be nuts. And um, so we're saying that We're not talking just theological exercise here. That's just a complete waste of time. We're talking about something that has absolutely impacted the way that we live as human beings, the coherence of our internal and our expressions of our lives. Mm. And and that's why this matters. Because if if I can't live this, we're we're just talking nonsense. And um, and, and Mm. we want to be able to express what that's like in our own journeys. Thank you guys for opening up a little bit of a can of worms, but also a little bit of a statement about maybe what the early church thought and what it means for us to understand that we are included. Would you give it a hand for these guys?